You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This is episode 107, The Truth About Fiducia Supplicans, with my friend and returning guest, Michael Lofton. Uh, before we jump into tonight's episode, guys, just a word about my sponsor, Havana Palace, on here on Church Road in Windsor, Ontario, for the best service and finest cigars. Go see Caesar and Eli. They treat all their customers like family. If y'all would be so kind as to go to facebook.com slash Havana Palace, give that page a like. I would greatly appreciate it. All right, guys, uh, we've got a bit of a controversial episode tonight. Um I've already had to ban somebody from the chat, so hopefully that's not indicative of the rest of the stream. But uh, I have my friend and returning guest, Michael Lofton of Reason and Theology here. Uh, the, no, I can think of nobody better to discuss this than Michael. Um, and so here we are. We're going to do some maybe Q&A, just some general topical conversation. But this is something that needs to get out there, needs to be um disseminated the truth needs to be disseminated there's a lot of dissent a lot of lies a lot of half truths and misinformation and we're going to try to uh dispel some of that darkness today so before we jump into it michael how are you doing this evening doing good dustin thanks for having me back on how you doing i'm doing well brother thank you and for anybody wondering this is a non-alcoholic corona uh source of vitamin d sun i didn't so. know they had non-alcoholic it, it, it tastes really really close to the real thing i'm, I'm very pleased actually well well, this is water if anybody's wondering so. <laughs> all right so we're good we're not we're not drinking the kool-aid right no i just got water and unfortunately i don't have any cigars so uh that's all right we'll, we'll be fine all right guys so uh yeah now if there's any mods that come in maybe Haley or chloe if you could just please monitor the comments if there's anything suspicious or fishy or downright you know blasphemous or inappropriate please block and ban the user Unfortunately, I already had to do that. Hopefully, I won't have to do that again. I, we'll I seem to attract some interesting people. So yeah, that. you, you kind of do. I don't know, man. We got two bald guys, two bearded bald guys on together. I don't know what it is. I don't know. It has to be the beard. I, I think so. I think yeah. so. Nothing about your content or anything. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Okay, so Fiducia Suplicans, Michael, I, I think it was like December 18th, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, I wake up. <laughs> and i'm on i'm on facebook right and i'm like what what is going on here the vatican approves of you know homosexual unions and all this stuff and i'm seeing a C msnbc headlines saying this and i'm like okay right off the bat i know something's got to be yeah <laughs> something's not right like something the headline has to be wrong something's going on uh what is this i couldn't believe it so first thing i see was uh, a vatican news correspondent she basically says it's not what it looks like here's the document and such and such and she puts a little bit uh, a little blurb a little blurb on there associated mm -hmm. with the with the document mm -hmm. she's basically like nothing's changed people with ssa can get blessed but can't have a wedding nothing to see here that was basically mm -hmm. it so i'm like okay i want to wait for michael lofton's take um the guy who is charitable balanced fair and most importantly, loyal and docile to the magisterium, which we as Catholics should all strive to be. So let me ask you this. Uh, in a nutshell, for those who don't know and have been living under a rock, what is the document Fiducia Supplicans? Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's a document released by the Vatican, as you noted, in um, December, where it discusses um, blessing persons who are attracted to people of the same sex and most uh, I mean, it also has other things in there with blessings for people living in irregular marriages like divorce or remarried. Uh, but the mm -hmm. most controversial part is a discussion about blessing for uh, same-sex couples. And so that's kind of where the the um, controversy surrounds. You know, what what is meant by blessing same-sex couples? Are we talking about blessing the union? Are we talking about blessing mm -hmm. them as a couple? Are we, are we talking about blessing sin? Because back right. in 2021, Pope Francis signed a document by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith saying, um, no, you can't bless sin. Church can't bless sin. And therefore, we yeah. can't bless the union of persons of the same sex. So what's this language about blessing couples of the same sex? It seems like this isn't about face and uh somebody um when I, I laugh when you said you woke up to a controversy because that's exactly what happened with me i yeah. woke up first thing i saw was a ton of messages of people saying how's pope splainer michael gonna explain this one and all yeah. they did was they like took that little snippet of the part that says um 
blessings for persons of or blessing for same sex couples. And they just took it out and say, see, there you go. And, you know, how's Michael going to spin this? And right, right. I didn't even read secondary sources or anything like that. I just said, I'm going straight to the document before I read anything else, mm -hmm. before I read somebody's opinion on this, their perspective. Um, no, I, I want to go straight to the source and read this thing and find out what's going on because they're showing me a little snippet yeah. of blessing for same sex couples. And it's like, Hey, what, what, what gives, you know, back in again, 2021, Pope Francis said you couldn't bless the union. So is there a change here? Right. So that's effectively what the document is. I'm happy to go into details and explain it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we wake up to these, these, uh, these headlines and they're just, they're, they're grandiose, they're verbose, and they seem to fly in the face of, like you said, the Vatican's 2021 declaration, the church does not have the power to bless uh, unions of persons of the same sex is what it says effectively, right? Uh, yeah. Church in cannot fact, do this. Yeah. In fact, I'll, I'll um, pull it up here. Yeah. That'd be great. <clears throat> Let's see. Respond some of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith, March 15, 2021. Um, it ends the document for saying, for the above mentioned reasons, the church does not have and cannot have the power to bless unions of persons of the same sex in the sense intended above. That's key. That's key in mm -hmm. the sense of intended above. What sense is that? Well, mm -hmm. That's where fiducia supplicans comes into play because what it does is it doesn't overturn what this document is saying. In fact, it over and over, and I'm happy to show you yeah. in the document, it over and over reasserts that 2021 decision. So far from overturning it, it reasserts it. Right. But that qualification from the 2021 document where it says, in the sense intended above, that's what fiducia supplicans is fleshing out. Yeah. So it's it's further expanding that part in a way that's harmonious with this document, not overturning it, but, but building on it. Uh, so in what sense can we bless um, uh, these persons? Well, again, if, if you want, I can actually share my screen and maybe show you some. Yeah, yeah. could you do um, that, brother? That would be great. Yeah, let me go to share screen. I think you might have to approve it. But Yeah, um, let me do that for you here. Uh, to stage. Mm -hmm. So this is the 2021 document that we've been discussing. And it says, again, the church does not have the power to bless unions of persons of the same sex in the sense intended above. Insofar as we are blessing the union itself, the relationship itself, mm -hmm. you can't do that because the church can't bless sin. Right. I mean, and that's right. common sense, right? For sure. For sure. <laughs> you, you, you can't bless it. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that, that should go without saying. It's so sad that we actually have to say this. Right. Um, but for some reason, well, multiple reasons, especially because of German bishops, some German bishops, we actually have to make this explicit. Um, but what happened is back in October, there were some cardinals who were stirring the pot. And telling people that what's going to happen is the church is getting ready to overturn this. The Pope is getting ready to change this. And he's getting ready to overturn this 2021 decision. And all of a sudden we started seeing a ton of secular headlines, you mm -hmm. know, not only secular, but also from uh, headlines in the church of people saying that the Pope's going to overturn these things. And again, it goes back to these cardinals who were spreading this information. Right. And I pointed to people even back then in October and showed, yeah, no, that's not what the Pope is saying. <laughs> that's yeah. not what he's saying at all. So just read what the Pope is saying and stop listening to these headlines. Well, most people didn't read. They just bought into the headlines. So they were ripe for the picking. And so when December and this document came out in December, Fiducia Supercons, they were already prepared and expecting for the Pope to overturn that 2021 decision. Yeah. Now, let me go back to sharing my screen. Yep. And I'll show you what the document actually says. So multiple times it reasserts that 2021 decision, Fiducia Supercons, multiple times. But you can especially see it here in paragraph 5. Mm -hmm. where it says the church does not have the power to impart blessings on unions of persons of the same sex. And it's quoting or referencing 
that response of the congregation of the doctrine of the faith. It's yeah, reasserting it's it. Quoting it. Yeah. Yeah. Reasserting it once again. So far from overturning it, it's reasserting the same thing. Um, and it is maintaining that this conviction is grounded in the Catholic doctrine of marriage. It is only in this context that sexual relations find their natural proper and fully human meaning. The church's doctrine on this point remains firm. Church or marriage is exclusive, stable, and indissoluble union between man and woman, so that can't change. And by right. the way, it's naturally open to the generation of children, and what contradicts it is inadmissible. So any act, sexual act outside of a marriage between one man and one woman open to procreation is sinful. So that would mean homosexual acts are sinful. So the document is nowhere saying homosexual acts are um, okay now. No, it's saying they're sinful. Right. It's nowhere saying we're overturning that 2021 20, decision. No, it's rather re restating it, reasserting it. It goes on to reassert it again over here in paragraph 11. The church does not have the power to confer its liturgical blessing when that would somehow offer a form of moral legitimacy to a union that presupposes or presumes to be a marriage or to an extramarital sexual practice. And the Holy Father reiterated this in his response to the cardinals. The, the response that the cardinals, that he sent to them back in July, and these mm -hmm. cardinals were twisting his words, saying, hey, get ready, he's going to change things. No, this document again sets the record straight and says, no, even in that dubia, he was not changing things. He was still reasserting the same stuff. So right. the narrative, the headlines, we were sold a bill of goods. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting because people then have to ask the question, okay, well, why then was it necessary to address this right. if it's just reasserting that 2021 decision? Well, interestingly enough, the uh, presentation section kind of answers that here. And it tells you that there were people who were struggling with that 2021 decision. They were struggling to understand it. And the church isn't going to change that 2021 de decision because it can't bless in. Right. But it is trying to accompany and help people understand why the church says it can't bless unions of persons of the same sex. Right. Versus so it's, just it's, asserting it. Instead of just asserting, it's trying to help those people because there were a lot of people after 2021 who just left the church. And they just said, you know what? Right. I, I don't want to be in the church anymore. So right. to try to help those people come back to the church, it says, well, here's why we said this in 2021. Here's why we're reasserting it now. So giving further explanation for it, further fleshing it out, further discussing, well, here's what we can't do, but here's what we can do. And also, most importantly, the document was responding to the German bishops. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Who are calling for mm -hmm. three things. They're calling for liturgical blessings for uh, same-sex unions. They were calling for the blessing of the union itself, not the persons. And they were calling for um, the uh, affirmation that same-sex acts are no longer sinful. Right. This document explicitly rejects all three assertions by those dissenting German bishops. So it is a refutation of the German bishops. So everybody who's asking, you know, why isn't the Pope doing anything about the bishops in Germany? Well, this is a direct response to what they're doing and essentially this, saying, here's what you can and can't do. This is one of them. There are yeah, other things he's also doing things with the German too, yeah. bishops. It's pretty complex because it's almost an entire Episcopal conference. So it's not just one bishop that he can... Yeah. address it's a, a whole bunch of them and he's he's trying to avoid another schism uh which is a very serious possibility at this point there's already a material schism from the german bishops but he's trying to avoid a formal schism most recently it's start it's starting to look like he's being successful in reining them in and they're starting to actually listen to him and comply um but we still have a long ways to go but anyways, that's the point is it's doing a lot of things. It's refuting German bishops and putting them in their place. Um, it's further confirming that 2021 decision because they were cardinals who were saying and putting it in the doubt and saying that Pope Francis is now going to abandon that. So it's saying, nope, mm -hmm. Pope Francis hasn't abandoned that. Um, and it's saying, OK, but here's what we can do. And now maybe that's the part that we kind of have to discuss. Yeah. You know, we already discussed what we can't do. You can't bless unions of persons of the same sex. So homosexual unions, you can't bless that. But what can then we bless? Right, exactly. Well, what the document talks about 
is it discusses blessing couples of the same sex. And again, when a person hears that, they think, well, there it is. You're just contradicting yourself because if you're blessing couples of the same sex, you're blessing their union. But there's a difference between a union and a couple. A couple is two persons in a union, not the union itself. Mm -hmm. If the union itself is the couple, then every time two people break up, they would cease to exist, right? Right. That's which is an absurd uh, position. Obviously, there's a distinction between a couple and a union. A couple, again, is two persons in a union. The union is the relationship. In this case, the church says with homosexual unions that this union is illegitimate. It is a sinful union. It's a union based on sin. It does not fulfill the commands of God. It is not in with the will of God. The document reasserts that in Fiducia Supercons. Um, so when it discusses then blessing same-sex couples, here's the distinction it makes. Okay. It says we can't bless them as a couple, and we can't bless their union. However, if the couple comes and asks for a blessing, we can bless them as individuals. Yes, they're individuals in this union. Yes, they identify as a couple. You can bless these two people who are, again, in a sinful union as a couple, a disordered relationship, but you can bless them as individuals. That's why when you look at paragraph 31, Mm -hmm. where it has this language of blessing couples in irregular situations and couples of the same sex, it immediately discusses not recognizing their union, not trying to legitimize their status, but rather blessing those people, the persons. It says yeah. the blessing upon those who, recognizing themselves to be destitute and in need of his help. And they do not attempt to claim a legitimation of their own status. So they're not trying to validate their union, and the church can't validate their union. But rather, it is giving the persons in this union grace to be freed from sin. And that's why it talks so that they may be freed from their imperfections and frailties. So I also want to point out paragraph 38. Because, and I'll share my screen yep. again. In paragraph 38, it's again comes with this language of blessing couples in an irregular situation, but then it talks about blessings for individuals. <laughs> right. So, so again, what it's doing here is it's saying, okay, well, a couple may come to you. Yeah. But when you bless them, you're blessing them as individuals. It's that the ordained minister asks that the individuals have peace, health, and a spirit of patience, dialogue, and mutual assistance, but also God's light and strength to be able to fulfill his will completely, which would mean that they would need to stop sinning against each other. And they right. could have what's called a holy friendship. That's the only kind of interaction they could have, a pure and chaste friendship. Two persons of the same sex, the only kind of relationship they should be having here is one of friendship, a holy friendship, nothing sexual in nature. So the sexual aspect is what does not fulfill his will, and that's what they need to be freed from. And with this blessing on the persons, it will help them be better disposed to repent of their sins and turn away from this sinful union. Um, so that's why it discusses couples and immediately goes on to discuss them individuals. as individuals yeah now what some people will point out is they'll say well in the other languages it doesn't speak of the individuals it speaks of them <laughs> right <laughs> but this is a distinction without a difference yeah because if the blessing is of them it's not of their union it's of them who's them two persons two individuals two individuals yeah. right so uh, it's the same thing it's a distinction without a difference it further proves the point the blessing is of them not the union not the relationship yeah, not the sin for sure. A them is not a union. A them refers to persons, it doesn't refer to relationships. That's not the appropriate um pronoun. So doesn't matter what language you're looking at, the the point is made. Again, when we discuss blessings of couples, we're not talking about blessing them as couples, and we're not talking about blessing their union. We're talking about the couple comes to you and asks for a blessing. You give them two individuals who, yes, are a couple and, yes, are in this union. You give them as persons, however, the blessing. 
Now, it notes that it has to be done in a way that avoids confusion or scandal. Mm -hmm. So if they're coming in two tuxedos or they're holding hands and they're giving people the impression that this is somehow validating their union, well, you can't do it because that would confuse people and that would cause scandal. So any priest who does it in that way um, is actually going against the document. It says... It can never be done in concurrence with civil ceremonies or the ceremonies of a civil union, not even in connection with them, nor can it be performed with any clothing, gestures or words that are appropriate to a wedding. Why? Because it would cause confusion and scandal and because mm. the church can't bless sin. And we don't want to give people the impression that we're blessing sin. Right. And so often the document also labors to make a distinction between these ritualized blessings that we have in the church versus spontaneous blessings. So what we're talking about is two people who are in a disordered relationship who maybe come to a retreat or something, and then they realize they need some help to get out of their sin and to conform themselves to God's will. And they come and ask for a blessing, not for some kind of legitimation of their union. Mm -hmm. That's prohibited but right. rather as needing assistance to follow God's will. Well, insofar as you're blessing persons and not the union, and insofar as it doesn't cause scandal, and insofar as it's there to help them repent of their sins and turn away from it and be conformed to God's will, then yes, you can bless, but you're blessing the persons. And this is why Pope Francis has said over and over and over, bless the persons, not the union. Bless right. the individuals, not the union. He's reasserted that over and over and over. And then even um, Fernandez kind of gives us a, an example of this. Cardinal Fernandez, the head of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, who wrote the document. Um, I'm going to share my screen and show you this. Mm -hmm. He says in this example of a blessing that he gives, you know, um, he says, the priest can recite a simple prayer like this. Look at these children of yours and grant them health, work, peace, and mutual help. Free them from everything that contradicts your gospel. <laughs> wow. So that would be sin, right? Free yeah. them from sin right. and allow them to live according to your will. Amen. Then it concludes with the sign of the cross on each of the two persons. persons. Now, why is that important? That's important because we're blessing them as individuals, not as a union, not as a couple, not as two individuals in the union. Yes, they are two individuals who identify as a couple and identify themselves as in a relationship. Right. But we don't bless them insofar as they are in a relationship. And we don't bless their union. We bless these two persons. Right. And it's not like the priest is standing there with the the you know the couple holding hands and he's making the sign of the cross over both of them simultaneously this is not this is they made it they went they went out of the way to say the sign of the cross be made on each of the two persons not as a collective each of the two persons we're talking about he says we're talking about something that lasts 10 or 15 seconds mm -hmm. it's spontaneous it's not planned it's not two tuxedos it's not yeah. wedding ceremony it's none of that it's rather a blessing on two persons. And so I'll say this, in all fairness to the document, the document is very clear what is meant by blessing couples in an irregular situation and couples of the same sex. It's very clear what is meant by that. And when we read it on its own terms, it's orthodox. It makes sense. Sure. My only problem with the document is, is exactly what people did to me on the morning of the document they took a snippet of this right here uh -huh. blessing of couples in irregular situations and couples of the same sex they took a snippet of that only a screenshot of that little segment right Headline, there yeah. and sent that out and now if you have no context if you don't if you haven't read the document carefully with an open mind when mm. you hear blessing of couples of the same sex what are you going to think you're going to think of blessing the union for sure. And so you could see why some people would get confused if all they have is an out of context snippet. You sure. could understand why people would be confused. And I understand that. I grant that. I totally am sympathetic with people who were confused because they just saw a headline or a snippet. What I'm not sympathetic to, however, 
is leaving it there and then going on social media and now telling people the church has changed its position. No. I understand a person being confused, but you have an obligation to go and look into it yourself and read it in context before you go to social media and disseminate claims. There's a difference between a person being confused versus a person going to social media and then telling people the church has changed its position. The church now blesses same-sex unions. There's a difference. Right. You can be confused without going to social media and spreading misinformation. So I'm not sympathetic to people who spread misinformation. I'm even less sympathetic to people who actually read the document in obviously a skeptical way, don't see what it says, and then twist what it means, and then present it as saying something it doesn't. They should know better. Because again, if you read it on its own terms, how it defines words, it's very clear what is meant by situations where you're blessing couples of the same sex. You're talking about where they come as a couple, yes, and they ask you for a blessing, but it is a blessing for them as persons not to validate their union. Yes, they're still in this sinf the sinful situation. Yes, they still think of themselves possibly even as a couple, and that's part of the problem. This is exactly why they need this blessing. The blessing, by the way, in the document is not one of approbation. It's not one of validation. Mm -hmm. Blessing, this is another part where Perhaps the document could have done better in selecting different terms, different sure. language. Mm -hmm. I think it could have done better in saying blessing of persons in a same-sex union rather than blessing couples of the same sex. Yeah, It's just open to people grabbing things out of context and abusing the document. The document is not so much to blame as, as the people are, but you want to do everything you can to minimize be, being taken out of context. So they could have done that. Yeah, the wording, yeah. The, the wording also with blessing. When you think blessing, what do you think of? Approval. You think of approval. Mm -hmm. That is how the term could be used, but the document notes explicitly that in this context, it's not talking about a blessing of approval. It's talking about a supplication blessing, a crying out blessing, a blessing that cries out to God and says, help me, a sinner. Give me grace. That's what kind of blessing we're talking about. Not approval, but rather supplication for grace to be freed from sin. That's a definition of blessing that is legitimate, but most people don't think of that when they think of blessing. So could they use the better term? Yes. Yes. Instead of talking about blessing, just call it supplication. Yeah. Just, uh, just mean, call it something else because though it's legitimate how they're using the term, it makes sense in context. Uh, and though it's inexcusable for people to take things out of context, in the day and age we live in, people are going to do that. So you have to do your best to minimize the ability for people to exploit your words. Sure. So again, this is where I think they could have done better. So if they had just used different terms, but meant the same thing, communicate the same thing, just use a different term, it probably would have cut down on some of this stuff. But at the end of the day, I don't know if it would have prevented the whole crisis that we saw after Fiducia, because as we saw, people were already ripe for the picking and ready and being prepared to hear the Pope is getting ready to change everything. Mm -hmm. There are headlines back in October before this document saying the Pope opens door to blessing same-sex unions. And again, it surrounds that controversy where four cardinals were telling everybody, hey, yeah, it looks like he's backing away from that 2021 decision. Looks like he might change some things. So they were sowing seeds of doubt. Yeah. And that's truly unfortunate. Um, so a couple of things, Mike. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, let okay, so... I remember you saying before, before any of this transpired, mm -hmm. you almost, in a prophetic kind of way, you almost predicted that this is what was going to happen in the church. And uh, you were actually, I, I don't know how, but you predicted this thing. There's nothing um, prophetic about it. It's really easy <laughs> to just see the writing on the wall, right? Uh, if, you said, if, if you see two plus two, you know the answer is yeah. four. You don't, there's nothing prophetic about it. You just look and see the situation says two plus two, and you can draw the conclusion. Right. But before the dubia came out, before any of this, you said, watch. this is, And you, I think you said it in the context of the German bishops. Like, this is what they're going to try to do. Um, if they don't get oh, their way. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. If, if they don't that, get their yeah. way outright, they're going to say, mm -hmm. okay, we're not blessing the union, right? But we're 
we're blessing that which is good, good. true, and beautiful in the union or right. whatever. So what if someone's co coming to you and says, that's all you're saying, Mike, is you're saying we're not blessing the sin. We're blessing the good in the union, but you can't separate the union from the act. And how would you respond to somebody who came to you with that rejoinder? Paragraph 31 says otherwise. So that, that's part of the problem. So again, what 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 you were effectively communicating there is I, I was noting that the German bishops, what they were trying to do is they're going to say, OK, well, fine, maybe we can't bless the union, but we can bless the good found in the union. Yeah, there were some trying to take that angle. And um, then the question is, OK, well, did the document adopt that position? Right. Um, no, but it adopts something else that's related to that. It does not say you can bless the good found in the union, this disordered union. And what good would we be referring to? We're talking about um, maybe uh, friendship acts or if like one, one of the persons is sick and the other person brings them medicine, is bringing the medicine a good act of friendship? Yes, of course. But it's being clouded by the fact that they're sinning against each other. So right. that 2021 document talks about those goods found in this disordered union can't be isolated from the fact that it's in the context mm -hmm. of them sinning against each other. So you can't bless the good found in this disordered union. That 2021 document says you can't do that. Right. Did this document overturn that? No. What it does is it says you can't bless the good found in this disordered union. However, as a byproduct of blessing the persons, whatever good is found could be enhanced and also purified. So enriched and purified. The object of the blessing is not the good. The object of the blessing is the persons. There is mm -hmm. a byproduct, however, for the good. That's not what the German bishops were saying. The German bishops were saying, no, the object of the blessing is the good. And the 2021 right. document is saying, no, the object of the blessing can't be the good because it's being overshadowed by the evil. So the document doesn't overturn that. If you read paragraph 31, it talks about these persons who are being blessed the good found in their disordered union can be enriched, healed, and elevated. I'll I'll share my screen and yep. show that to you. Sure. So it's making an important distinction here, a legitimate one, and one that further confirms what I was saying uh, a while back. It doesn't contradict it. Within the horizon outline here appears the possibility of blessings for couples in irregular situations and couples of the same sex, the form of which should not be fixed ritually by ecclesiastical authority to avoid producing confusion with the blessing proper to the sacrament of marriage. In such cases, a blessing may be imparted that not only has an ascending value, but also involves the invocation of a blessing that descends from God upon those who. Now, that's important. Because it shows you the object of the blessing is not a union. Right. Because you don't describe a union as those who. A union is not a who. A union is a what. Yeah. So upon those who refers to these two individuals who are in this union. But the object of the blessing is the individuals. It's the persons. So it descends from God upon those who recognizing themselves to be destitute and in need of his help. Why? Because they're in sin. And they do not claim a legitimation of their own status. So they're not there to validate their sinful union. Rather, they're there for a blessing to help them be freed from their sinful union. But who beg that all that is true, good, and humanly valid in their lives. And there's, there's this terminology of good found in this yeah. relationship. Yeah. And the reason why is the relationship is not entirely sinful and sexual. There are other aspects that are in and of themselves good, in and of themselves, and so far as they're isolated, they're good. And that's what it's referring to here. Right. But again, as the 2021 document notes, they're being overshadowed and because of this other aspect, and that is the sin found in that relationship. They beg that all that is true, good, and humanly valid in their lives and their relationships be enriched, healed, and elevated by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, look at what it's saying. The object of the blessing is not the true, good, and humanly valid. It's the persons. It's those who. Right. And as a byproduct 
as a byproduct of the blessing, that which is good, true, and humanly valid in their lives can be enriched, but also healed. That friendship that they have, the good found there, needs some healing. It needs some healing because they're sinning against each other. So enriched, healed, and elevated by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can come upon them and help them to stop sinning against each other and now actually have a friendship that is no longer based on sin, but one that is based on real friendship, real love. And it says, these forms of blessings express a supplication that God may grant those aids that come from the impulses of his spirit. What classical theology calls actual grace. So we're talking about God imparting actual grace on them. That's what's meant by blessing. Blessing mm -hmm. is not approval here. Blessing is an imparting of grace on them so that they stop sinning. Mm -hmm. So that human relationships may mature. How does it mature? And grow in fidelity to the gospel. <laughs> because yeah, their relationship right now it needs to mature in grown fidelity to the gospel and they they need to stop sinning because this is inconsistent with fidelity to the gospel so that friendship may mature by being faithful to the gospel by detaching from sin and any sinful elements so that they may be freed from their imperfections such as sin and frailties, and that they may express themselves in the ever-increasing dimension of the divine love. So again, to summarize, your question is, is the object of the blessing the good? No, the object of the blessing is people, those who. Persons. However, there is a benefit, there is an effect on the good found there, but the object is not the good. So, the 2021 decision still remains intact. You can't bless the good found in the union, but the document further expands, but there can be an effect on the good found in the union. Yes, because the object of the blessing is, so it, it can't be the good in the union because the object of the blessing is not the union, it's the persons, the individuals. Correct. Nor even the good, in, nor, the good or the bad. It, right. The object of the blessing is it the good or the bad in the union, in the it's union the persons, yeah. right. and there can then be an effect on the good and the bad in that union. You know, I was really surprised actually when I read paragraph thirty-one, because you know there's a lot of folks who say um, this document says nothing about repentance explicitly, turning away from sin, but paragraph thirty-one, as you were just sh showing, says those who recognize themselves to be destitute mm -hmm. i mean if you recognize yourself as destitute isn't mm -hmm. that kind of a indication that you're acknowledging that you're a sinner and you need grace and you want to turn from your sinful that, ways that's one let me show you another yeah let's there's see several some more. of them all there's right let's several. see some more that's certainly one paragraph 10 is another uh, therefore, those who invoke God's blessings through the church are invited to strengthen their dispositions through faith, for which all things are possible, and to trust in the love that urges the observance of God's commandments. What do you think that is? That's that's the notion of repentance. Right. Urging the observance of God's commandments is a call to repentance. That it's just the same same thing. Um, would it be nice if they use the term repent? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I, I think the document could be better written. I've never said otherwise. I think most church documents could be better written. Now. Yeah. But, but then again, um, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they still have a lot of good in them and they communicate the point that needs to be communicated and it's communicated here. But number two, I'll also say this. I don't accept the faulty assumption that unless the document restates the need for repentance, somehow the call for repentance is now null and void. Because yes. that would then mean, unless the church restate, restates every one of its theological points in every single future document, then every single yeah, theological point is now null and void. This, this is yeah. absurd. The church obviously builds on itself, clearly. Now, right. be that as it may, it still does discuss this urging observance of God's commands. And, and really anybody who just reads this document with an open mind will clearly see this is nowhere validating sin. It likens their acts to 
people who are addicted to drugs. I mean, like it's this is very right. it's very clear that it takes yeah. a very negative view of what they're doing in this sinful union. And so obviously it's nowhere condoning it. And the whole purpose of the blessing is that they be freed from it. Right. And uh paragraph I think paragraph uh, paragraph eleven, I believe, says the only uh morally licit sexual relations are those uh between a man and a woman in a heterosexual marital union and that's the every, everything else would be morally illicit it says that in paragraph 11 i believe right so there there's a lot here i mean this isn't a very long document that any anybody could sit down and read in one sitting but i i think that what happened is most people either didn't read the document or the few who read it did not read it with an open mind they read it with this hermeneutic of suspicion already with this preconceived idea that it is changing something and they read it in a skeptical way look you can read anything in a skeptical way and come mm -hmm. to conclude the worst thing go and read the bible with, in, with a skeptical um hermeneutic and you'll come away as an atheist you'll come away as a critic of sacred scripture um, but if you read it with the hermeneutic of continuity, as we're supposed to be doing with a judgment of charity, then you'll come away saying, yeah, I totally understand what the document is doing. So that's another added element to the controversy here. Most people just didn't read it. And that's just an ongoing battle that we have in the church. Right. But the other part is when we do read it, we read it with these glasses on that is suspicious of everything. And we read it in the worst possible way. And I just want to say, but you don't do that with the Bible. And they say, well, the Bible's inspired and this isn't inspired. That's irrelevant. The point, however, right. is the Bible is written with an assistance of the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? Documents of the magisterium also have assistance of the Holy Spirit, even when they're not infallible in nature. That's Donum Veritatis. Yeah. That's Pastor Eternus. That's multiple documents discuss this charism of assistance of the Holy Spirit for even non-infallible teachings of the magisterium. And that that's the only point that I really have to rely on when I make the comparison to the Bible. So I think the right. analogy stands. When we read the Bible, we don't read it with this kind of hermeneutic of suspicion. And if you do, yeah. you'll probably become an atheist. Good point, Michael. Uh, and on that subject, actually, somebody has a question. Uh, the sure. Stoic Virginian says, what does he think the origin of the distrust of the Holy Father? It seems like it has been a phenomenon from the beginning of this pontificate. Why is that? A very poignant you, question, given what you just discussed. If you look at the beginning of this pontificate, what happened was immediately the news portrayed Pope Francis as a liberal who was here to overturn church teaching from day one. And for a while, Catholics on the whole weren't really buying it. It was more of a secular media kind of thing that was spinning that narrative. And Catholics on the whole weren't really, at least from what I could tell, buying that notion. And they were fighting against the media. But what happened was after a while, report after report after report, headline after headline after headline from the secular media, I think wore a lot of people out. And they finally got to the point, well, look, this is difficult to explain, or there's just no way that the media can get everything wrong. And They started to see Catholics who started to chime in with the secular media, and it just developed. We developed 10 years of conditioning from yeah. headlines originating in the secular world, but then spilling over into Catholic headlines that just says nonstop every single day, every hour of every day, every minute that you scroll through on Facebook and Twitter, you're just seeing post after post, headline after headline for every single day, for years and years and years. It caused a great deal of conditioning in the mind of the average Catholic who didn't actually go and verify and give the benefit of the doubt to Holy to the Holy Father. They just kind of, after a while, bought into this stuff. And yeah, just said, it, well, it, got, just, it has yeah. to be true at this point. My my favorite YouTuber is saying it. My favorite priest right. is saying it. My favorite bishop and cardinal is saying it. It has to be true at this point. So it then spilled over into the church, created this narrative. And at this point, you, the Pope has never given a fair shake. There's nothing yeah. he could say or do that will overturn the skeptic's mind. Yeah. Unless the skeptic is willing to reevaluate the positions that they've adopted and have an entire paradigm shift, he can't say anything clear enough to the liking of the skeptics and critics. They can take a headline 
they they can take something where Pope Francis says uh, homosexuality is a sin, and they will spin it to say homosexual homosexuality, according to Pope Francis, is now a good, and yeah. they'll spin it. I've actually seen them do that in that particular instance. Um, so again, it boils down to conditioning and a hermeneutic. Yeah, I agree. I think people just got after a while; they just got so worn out. They're like, "Well, this this stuff has to be true." There's just mountains of, upon mountains of evidence, and I just can't do this anymore. I'm just going to yeah. buy into the narrative. And that's not to say that everything he does is right. And that's not right. to say nothing can be criticized. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that um, he is the best pope ever. Um, we can have those discussions. We can have those debates. But that's a different issue than. Pope Francis is teaching heresy. Pope Francis is trying to overturn the church. Pope Francis doesn't believe in the dogmas of the church. Pope Francis is trying to fundamentally change the essential constitution of the church. These are all claims that are being made about him that are just simply not true. Whatever faults he has, and we can discuss those faults, whatever they may be, they're not what they're saying they are. Right, exactly. Um, and the Stoic Virginian also says, let's see if we can tackle this real quick. Um, given that the successor of Francis upholds his judgment, what will happen to those who've ob obstinately resisted the Holy Father and have been hoping for the next Pope to abrogate his teaching? This is a good question I've, I've, because I've been trying to point this one out. You have some people who are saying that Pope Francis isn't even the Pope. And they're hoping that the next Pope will overturn this pontificate and declare Pope Francis to be an anti-Pope. What happens when that doesn't happen? Well, they're going to say that guy also isn't a Pope. Okay. Yeah. What happens when his successor also doesn't overturn it? You're going to say that guy too isn't a Pope. In other words, you're going to live the rest of your life as a set of a contest if, if yeah. you don't turn away from this. Or for people who say, well, he is the Pope, but I'm just hoping another Pope is going to overturn all of his judgments. Num number one, that's incredibly unlikely. Anytime we've ever had a Pope try to overturn his predecessor's acts, it has always been a disaster every single time. Uh, think of the cadaver synod. Yeah, <laughs> for instance, I mean, yeah. it's just been a disaster every single time. It's unlikely, it's not going to happen. What you'll likely see, however, what popes tend to do is they may just not reassert something that a previous pope has said, they'll yeah. just kind of no longer reassert it. Um, but they rarely will directly contradict it and overturn it, so that's just not going to happen. You can stop hoping for that because you're you're basing your life on a false hope here number two i would also challenge the underlying problem and that is this unhealthy position that adopts this perspective that the this pontificate needs to be overturned you need to challenge that assumption because it, it's it i would ask okay what do you think needs to be over, overturned amor satitia fiducia supplicans well that's the problem there's nothing wrong with the documents in and of itself that's the problem so you're talking about reversing something that doesn't even need to be reversed to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the hermeneutic of suspicion, really. And you've said this multiple times. I wish people would, you know, really clue in clue in on this and zero in on it. Cause it really is, it really is the master key, this hermeneutic of distrust and suspicion. We've just been conditioned over the last 10 years and we've just kind of accepted it hook, line and sinker. Um, I did have a few more questions if you didn't mind, brother. Sure. Um, uh, before before we get to them, however, the, the Stoic Virginian asks, what are my favorite cigars under $4? I'm a budget man. Well, so am I. Uh, you know, it's it, it can be expensive. Uh, my dad spends hundreds of dollars a month and I don't have this, I don't have his kind of bank. So for me, what I like right now, I'm smoking a Jose Marti Cuba Libre. These are Nicaraguan. These I got these probably $30 US for a bundle of 20 from Costco in Florida. And believe it or not, these are some of the best cigars I've had and they're super cheap. I also like uh Quorum, which is Nicaraguan by JC Newman, also very cheap and very good. So those are some of my favorites under $4 a stick. Um, okay. So back to the issues, uh, Michael. So we dealt with, um, you know, the document not, not restating clearly the word repentance uh another another one people kick around as well if the document was so orthodox you know mm -hmm. the africans don't play with their orthodoxy and the africans by and large have rejected the document so ergo there's something wrong here 
Two two things. When since when did the African bishops become the standard of orthodoxy and not the magisterium and not the pope? That's that's number one. Uh, I mean, I think of the time when almost the entire West, including the African bishops, dissented against the Council of Constantinople. Too. I mean, mm. are we to say that somehow again? Um, local churches and local geographic regions are now the standard of orthodoxy. Well, congratulations. That's no longer Catholicism. That's either ortho Eastern Orthodoxy or Protestantism or something else. Um, Good point. Then number two, I would also say, um, I was hearing a lot of people saying, hey, the African bishops are rejecting it. Check out this conference. They're rejecting the document. And then I would go and read the document, and they're actually reasserting Fiducia Supercons and completely affirming it. So there, there were instances where that happened. Yeah, uh, there were a few cases where some um, African bishops were offering pushback, but they seemed to be in the minority. Um, then there were other cases where African bishops were saying, "Well, we're not rejecting the document, but we don't believe it's applicable to our territory because we have criminal laws against." Um, homosexuality, and if we are to offer a blessing to such persons, that could put these people in jeopardy and danger and cause them to be physically harmed or arrested, and therefore it's not applicable to our territory. Fernandez and Pope Francis looked at that and said, yeah, that's that makes sense. That's applicable. Um, it, it, it could be the case, or it might not be applicable to your territory. It could be the case that you as an ordinary, as a bishop, have to kind of determine, does this even apply to my territory? Yeah, that's different than saying the document is heretical or it's theologically wrong. Those are different claims. Right. To say this doesn't apply to my territory because of some practical circumstance is not at all to say I reject the document or I think it's heretical or I think this abandons the faith. That's something else. And people were twisting a lot of the African bishops into saying something that most of them weren't saying. Uh, but even then, I don't care. Every single African bishop in the world and every single Western bishop in the world and every single, um, I don't know, bishop in China in the world, doesn't matter, name a geographic region, every single bishop in Uruguay, wherever, they could all reject the document and say, I think it's heretical and it would mean nothing to me. You know why? Because we've had entire geographical regions. We've had cases where almost every bishop in the world rejected um, the... Uh, Council of Nicaea, or the dogma that Jesus is consubstantial with the Father, doesn't matter to me. That would just mean that all of these bishops are wrong. At the end of the day, I'm a Catholic. I follow the magisterium. The magisterium is made manifest in the bishop when he teaches as a universal pastor, which he did in Fiducia Subcons, or the entire college of bishops. Now, the entire college of bishops, in some cases, could be reduced to a very few orthodox bishops, as it was in the days of the Arian crisis. So let's say you have 90% of the bishops of the world who reject fiducia supercons. They're wrong. And that also then means that the college of bishops, I mean, it's not even expressing itself with these 90, 90 bishops, but it could even be the case if you have all of these bishops, maybe 90% of them who say, we're breaking with Rome on this point. They're no longer members of the College of Bishops. If they start to uh, create a schism or reject the fundamental authority of the Pope, they're not even a member of the College of Bishops anymore, and they're mm -hmm. definitely not a manifestation of the College of Bishops. So again, as a Catholic, I follow the magisterium. Um, whenever local bishops or geo, um, national territories reject something from the magisterium, that is not the magisterium. That's them dissenting against the magisterium. Right. Um, and, and so part of the problem here is ignorance on how the magisterium works, what the College of Bishops is, when you where to identify it, how to identify it, um, how it functions and what our obligations are to the magisterium. I'll tell you this, there is nothing in Catholic tradition that allows for public dissent against the magisterium. There's nothing that allows for you to publicly dissent against fiducia subcons. Mm -hmm. There are things that would allow you to uh, express opinions, express concerns, but never dissent an outright rejection. Yep. Um, in fact, there are things in the magisterium that say that dissent, outright rejecting this, is gravely sinful. Yeah, was that uh, was that Pope Pius X who said that? Pius X, among others. 
Um, so that would then mean if you have a bishop who's publicly dissenting or a cardinal who's publicly dissenting against fiducia subcons, according to the magisterium, that's gravely sinful. Yeah. And and I would just say, if you don't like that, don't be mad at me, be mad at the magisterium. And if you're mad at the magisterium, you might need to reevaluate your relationship with the Catholic Church. Yeah, that's pretty sobering, pretty sobering thought. Sometimes, you know, it's... It, it's a harsh reality that we need to be confronted with, but that's the truth. That's the truth that people need to hear. If you have that much of a problem with the magisterium, you really need to ask, what is your relationship with the church at this point? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what about this thing too, about, you know, you see, I've seen James Martin and I've seen some others too, uh, giving so-called blessings and they appear from what the photo op shows at least uh, in the uh, verbiage underneath or what have you, they appear to be in direct contravention to the uh, particulars of the document. Like you'll have Father James Martin, he had two guys in front of the altar in suits holding hands, and he, he appeared to be giving a, bl a blessing in between the two of them. Um, and I've seen others too with, you know, a couple, with the priest has his hands on both of them at the same time. This was in Uruguay, I think. So like, you know, okay, fine. The document's orthodox, but it's going to be abused and it's going to start a whole snowball effect and it's going to go out of control. This document's created nothing but strife and problems. We shouldn't have issued it in the first place because it's just going to be ripe for, ab for abuse. Abuse does not negate proper use. If it did, we would have to get rid of the Bible because everybody, every, every day there are millions of people who abuse the Bible. Um, there are millions of people who abuse all kinds of things in um, magi from magisterial documents. That doesn't mean we get rid of everything written in the last 2,000 years. Again, abuse does not negate proper use. Oddly enough, those are the only two instances that I've seen. The Uruguay priest, where I didn't see him blessing both of them simultaneously, but there are other problems, such as they're both in suits. And this clearly isn't spontaneous. Mm. And this is clearly giving scandal. And this is clearly premeditated and filmed in advance. Or, you know, there are people ready there to film it and yep. take pictures and disseminate on social media, violating the document left and right that tells you you can't do this. There's that and there's the Father James Martin. Those are the only two instances that I've seen. Now, maybe there's others. I just haven't seen them. Yeah. I'm not justifying either one of those. I've called both of those instances out on my channel and gone through yeah, and reviewed have. them and showed what's wrong with them and um, called for discipline in their case. That being said, two two abuses, and it's been out since December. I honestly would have expected more. Yeah. I honestly expected way more abuses than this. I, I expected abuses literally every single day. Um, so I'm actually a little shocked that we haven't had every single day some yeah. scandal that has come out just because I know that people constantly abuse things. So I'm, I'm a little curious as to why we haven't seen more abuse again, not justifying the ones that we've seen, sure, sure. not making light of scandal from the ones that we've seen, but just simply pointing out, gosh, only two. Yeah, <laughs> and it's think been since be December. I would have yeah. thought a whole lot more than this. Yeah, um, that's true. But, he, but even so again, abuse does not negate proper use. That being said, if something is ripe for abuse, and if it is being exploited unjustly through neglect and abuse, then you might want to withdraw the legitimate use. Yeah. Right? So right. if there were a situation where you're constantly seeing it abused every day, yeah, as a pope, you might want to re- um, reevaluate fiducia supercons and reverse this discipline because if if you have have presented something that is good in and of itself but in the majority of its application people are abusing it well you're you're kind of defeating the whole purpose for it again abuse does not negate proper use but if it is being overly abused left and right constantly in the majority of cases then it's doing more harm than good so yeah. prudentially it's probably good to just reverse it at that point that we haven't come to that because that's not happening right now yeah, thank and, and thanks be to God for that. I mean, like you said, I think I think there would be a lot more examples that we would see flooding social media, but I, those are the only two that I've seen myself personally. With, with how vocal social media is today, isn't it yeah. amazing we haven't seen any more? It really is, honestly. Um, one thing I did want to ask you as well. Uh, so, what in terms of de development, right? What's mm -hmm. actually new here? 
uh, because the church is always to our understanding. If, if somebody has same sex attraction, what's stopping them from going to a priest, getting blessed, say, Hey, I want to live according to the gospel. I want to repent of my sins. Father, please give me the grace of God. Help me do this. And boom, they're on their way. So what's different about this document? What's the development here that, that makes it new in, in that sense? So according to the document and also the clarification that Fernandez gave, not that the document need to be clarified, but that so many of the critics and skeptics caused scandal and confusion and twisted it, that needed clarification. Fernandez answers that question specifically, as does the document. The development is in reference to the distinction between spontaneous blessings and liturgical or ritualized blessings. That's the development here. And it's one that okay. was already implied and it was one that we already kind of assumed, but it's further made explicit. That's the way development works. It often takes things that we had already assumed or were implied and just draws them out and makes them explicit. Um, many church documents do that. Let me show you the... Uh, press release from mm -hmm. Fernandez where he brings us out more. This is from sure. point four. The real novelty of this document, the one that requires a generous effort of reception and from which no one should declare themselves excluded. It's not the possibility of blessing couples in irregular situations. That's not the novelty here. Right. So which we would says, think well, that couldn't you is. have already done this before? Yes. That's yes. not the point. Right. It is the invitation to dis distinguish between two different forms of blessings, liturgical, or ritualized, and spontaneous and pastoral. The presentation clearly explains that the value of this document is that it offers a specific and innovative contribution to the pastoral meaning of blessings, permitting a mm. broadening and enrichment of the classical understanding of blessings, which is closely linked to a liturgical perspective. This theological re reflection based on the pastoral vision of Pope Francis, implies a real development from what has been said about blessings in the magisterium and the official text of the church. And that's true, because can you point me to any document that uh, in this kind of detail makes that distinction? Some people are bringing out the fact that, yeah, Benedict kind of made that distinction before. Yeah. yeah, but it was a distinction that he kind of made in passing. It wasn't as explicit and as drawn out as this document. Yeah. Ergo development. So that's really something. If you look at Fernandez's own words, we're missing the forest from the trees. Everybody's thinking the development is the blessing of people in same-sex relationships. That's not even it. It's blessings. It's forms of blessing. That's Part the, of the document here. too. And yeah. You just read the document and know that. You don't even have to read Fernandez to know that. You just read the document. It's clear. What do you think are some... So there was a, um, a clarification issued on, I think, January 4th of uh, mm -hmm. this year. Uh, what are some takeaways from that clarification? Because if I'm recalling correctly, Fernandez uses some pretty strong unequivocal language when it comes to dispelling certain myths or falsehoods about the document. I think there's some key takeaways there. Did you, did you see that as well? Well, the one I just read to you is, is the January 4th one. Great uh, press release. Highly recommend everybody read it uh, in addition to the document. You might be referring to that, or you might be referring to something else he did right at the same time, where There's he gave some... an interview. Oh, the and interview! He yeah. was calling out the German bishops. Right. He was really, you know, he was really ridiculing and mocking them. Even that, Saying, I, that, you know, that I you... didn't see, but <laughs> oh, that was kind of hilarious. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why I actually appreciate Fernandez, um, because he'll 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 go toe to toe with um, with. The radical traditionalists and the radical progressives and call both of them out i appreciate that because that's kind of what i try to do is address both of those extremes and the problems there whenever necessary and he has no problem in doing that um so i thought that was kind of interesting that he went off on the german bishops basically saying you guys think that you're more enlightened than all of us all of all of us who re realize that homosexual acts are still sinful you you german bishops think we're all peasants but it's actually you who are delusional he was just going off on them it was hilarious oh wow he was wow. just mocking mocking them the whole time it was is great. that available in english to read i yeah i did a sh whole show reviewing the the interview it was hilarious oh man that's great that is i, I love fernandez honestly <laughs> it was only... available it was available right around the time that this document came out so you can probably find it on the channel i have a, a whole playlist of like over 70 videos reviewing questions related to fiducia supercons and it's wow. somewhere in there. People will say, well, see, isn't that evidence that the document is confusing? No, it's evidence that people twisted the document and it's meeting 
said meaning and and then they said things that weren't true about it and that needed a whole lot of interaction and response yeah well I, the document I, itself needed one video to just kind of yeah. review it that's it you, you, you didn't did. need anything else yeah it was a good 70 other videos that have been needed to respond to all of the twisting of the document yeah well you know your efforts have been uh tireless and i i so appreciate them and i know so many others have as well uh you're just and i mean not to not to puff you up and you know you, you're the first person to know this it's god's grace working in and through you but the way that god has used you and is using you to bring peace to souls bring souls back to the church people who are confused about entering the church or leaving uh, you're really ministering and you're a bomb to their souls and the work that I you're hope. doing. So it's it's so important, man. And uh, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on here tonight sure. and probably, you know, beating the, the a dead horse for the 71st time in another video. But uh, it's new for my channel. And you know what? I wasn't going to even touch this with a 10 foot pole, but I um, I just felt a moral, you know, a moral obligation. Like I have to speak on this. And my wife encouraged me as well. She says, you need to say something. You need to bring somebody on that can shed some light on this. And I said, okay, right away, I'm going to I'm gonna get the bat signal out and get a hold of Michael. And uh, so, brother, I thank you so much for doing this uh, with me and for me. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you for the work that you do at Reason and Theology as well. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. So do you have any final thoughts before we hang it up tonight? Oh no, that that's effectively it. I appreciate you having me on and, and doing this. And yeah, sometimes it can kind of feel like, all right, this is beating a dead horse. But then I have to remind myself, as you kind of point out here, there's some people this is new for them. There's some yeah. people who are new to the church, or they haven't followed the controversy, or this is the first time they've heard of 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 your channel and that are being exposed to it, or you just whatever the circumstances are. Um, <clears throat> and so it might be new for them. So. Yeah. You know, hopefully, hopefully this will benefit them for everybody else that this is already beating a dead horse for. Well, you know, OK, I get it. I understand. But just just think of the other people. <laughs> yeah. It, something, something's always new for somebody. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, well, it's kind of like I mean, think about how many times Catholic apologists are asked the question, you know, where where does the Bible teach purgatory? And it's like, oh yeah, God. The, the millionth time I've answered this. What? Yeah. Right. It's the millionth time for you. But. It's the first time for the person asking you the question that they're going to hear an answer. So you got to right. do your best to not, you know, <laughs> you got to do your best to answer it. So. Yeah. Well, you must have done a really good job because the trolls were kept at bay. Uh, oh, well, didn't have know, to ban anybody, just that's, one person. That, so, that's interesting. That's, that's pretty good. Maybe, maybe they've just learned at this point that, you know, it's just not going to work. Yeah. I'm going to continue to do what I do. So it is what well, it is. Keep it up, brother. And uh, <laughs> with that, guys, uh, I just want to. Thank you all for tuning in, and uh, if you want, you can upload this video and share it on your channel if you if you want, Mike, for sure. Oh, yeah, I absolutely will. Um, okay, so guys, you've been tuned into Holy Smoke, Cigars, Catholic, as a Man, Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was episode 107, The Truth About Fiducia Suplicans with Michael Lofton of Reason and Theology. Make sure you go check that channel out, guys. Subscribe, and uh, you have a... Um, a course about the magisterium was it the maximus institute Michael? Mm -hmm. maximus institute.com that's correct i also yes. have a few on um podia uh reason.podia.com and in fact i'll be transferring that maximus course to the podia website pretty soon yeah and that's important because you know er, people need to know how the magisterium the teaching office the teaching authority in the church works and mm -hmm. you do a great job in, in breaking that down showing the you know the theological notes the different level, levels of authority that different documents have proclamations mm -hmm. have so definitely guys go check out the maximusinstitute.com as well check out reason and theology and make sure you check out the fiducia suplicons playlist if this doesn't satiate your thirst you've got <laughs> 60 70 other videos yeah, to choose a from. lot more <laughs> um and hopefully there won't be many more needed but you never know right i don't know uh, i feel like they're starting to go silent about the issue I, I i hope they finally have just been uh beaten into silence <laughs> at this point know, it, it, it's funny it, it's funny you say that because I was telling a, I was telling a buddy this the other day. I said, and just like that, everybody stopped talking about Fiducia Suplicans. Honestly, Don't move on to the next controversy. Just give it time. Yeah, and everybody forgot about Fernandez's book. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. they kind of used that to 
uh, undermine Fiducia. They'll, they'll move on to something else next week. Just yeah, wait. we'll just we're just waiting. We're we're waiting with the armor on, hunkering down, just waiting for the next <laughs> bomb to drop. You know, whatever that is, Good. it's coming. Lord knows. Oh, I know what it's going to be. It's going to be the uh, the document on gender ideology. That's going to yeah. be the, the next thing. So. Yep, that's going to be it. <laughs> That'll be interesting given what Pope Francis just said about gender ideology being the well, biggest problem. Fernan- Fernando says his, his um, you know, the traditional um, wing of the church, the, well, I should say rather the radical traditional wing of the church because they're anything but traditional in many cases. But he was saying that group of people, while well, they've been critics of the documents that have been coming out lately, but with this new document on gender ideology, they're actually going to be really happy. And I just thought, Fernandez, you underestimate your critics. <laughs> you underestimate, <laughs> you underestimate the the their side. ability to twist what is said and and turn it into something it's not. You underestimate them. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. You underestimate the power of the dark side, my friend. That's it. <laughs> Good intentions, though. I mean, he's obviously you know he's got he's got bright eyed, yeah, bushy tailed, wide eyed intentions. They but... just don't understand how things work. Feet on the ground, and that's become painfully obvious about. Um, the um, the papacy, the dicasteries, they're very much out of touch with how things are on social media. In some cases, they're still using fax machines and everything. It's it's hilarious how... Hey, look, just look at their website, for goodness sakes. Yeah, it's just, just uh, come on, y'all. y'all they need, need a social media advisor. They- <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, they need a website <laughs> update desperately, too. Something, I don't know. <laughs> that font is really hard to read, man. <laughs> all right well, all right guys good stuff. i enjoyed it thank you so much for having me on you're welcome brother i'm gonna end the broadcast guys in three two one